Well, hello, fellow baseball nuts. Did I think I was ever going to utter those immortal words again? Probably not. What a joy it is to be back, and thank you for joining us on the Johnny and Josh Show. And as the name suggests, we've got him back as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the legend that is the greatest sports pundit on any medium for my money there's ever been in my lifetime, Mr. Josh Chetwin. JC, we're back! Goldie, I can't believe we've gotten the team back together again. And I appreciate the kind words, but what I see myself as doing on this show is playing the role of personal catcher. Now, think of Eddie Perez or Charlie O'Brien with Greg Maddox for your beloved Braves, or for my Red Sox, Doug Mirabelli with Tim Wakefield. My role is to help a unique yet sometimes hard to handle talent, the legend that is Johnny Gould, get the best out of his game. You see, if, if, if you're my catcher, my own personal catcher, then obviously I need my own personal bat boy. There is no one better for the job than the man, ladies and gentlemen, who was quoted as saying he was to TV what King Herod was to babysitting. Ladies and gentlemen, he's back. Eric, the producer! Thank you very much, Johnny. Although, you know, my producer skills are back in a foray, but through a camera lens instead of you know but i'm still yelling you earpieces it is going to be back it is going to be your babysitter again uh i'll probably regret it in a, in a few minutes though buddy you spent your whole career in that gallery wishing you were in front of the camera forcing yourself onto the show i even had to pretend to be late for a program back in the days of channel five so you could get front so this is exactly where you always plan to be part of the team in front of the mic part of the podcast and so many pre's got to be on in front of the camera. Exactly. Goldie, Eric was, Eric was always, no, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, JC, as you know, we've both got great faces for radio. And that's why the podcast medium was always designed for us. But for those listeners who, it's so great to have everybody back from the baseball community. But if you were not li- viewers of Channel 5 Baseball, um, just to remind everybody, we did a show on Channel 5, 97 through to 2008, the only program that was on the channel for that duration from its origination in 97 to 2008. Uh, and here we are, 12 years later, doing a podcast. Could you ever imagine, JC, you and me, the social media legend that we're not doing a podcast? Yeah, I think you mispronounced it as like a podcast for the first five times we talked about doing this. So excited, Goldie. We've had such a great response from people who used to watch our show, but obviously we want to expand. And for those who don't know us, my background, I played for the Great Britain national team for 10 years. Uh, I am old and broken and finally hung up the cleats in 2016. And since the show ended way back when, I, uh, after therapy, of course, uh, was able to uh, have some success writing books for a while. I also worked as a baseball agent, so I uh, represented players, some who reached the major leagues, and we'll get an opportunity to talk about that as time goes by. Eric, talking of uh, old and broken, what have you been up to in the last I've always years? been bold and bro- old and broken, and... Uh... That's the thing. I've, I've been lucky enough since we went off air in 2008 with the Channel 5 show. I've been able to still be involved in baseball and other sports as well. Uh, but I, I, I wouldn't give anything more than just be with you guys again and, uh, and rehash the glory days and looking forward to more glory days. Of course, many people don't know that Eric is involved in the world of television uh, and obviously supporting baseball as well as other TV shows. And I'm assuming, Eric, that nothing's changed. You keep that cap on for everything except for when you take a shower is what I've been told. The only time you take it off. And funerals. And funerals. Okay. But, you have but, changed. But not bar mitzvahs or quinceaneras, right, Eric? Well, you know. Well, Add on for those. Well, guys, I just want to say on a personal level, one, a massive thanks to the legend that is Nat Coombs and his team, Harry, Liam, and all the guys involved that have uh, that have basically been the reason why we've got this podcast off the ground. Because if it had been left to us, which it has been for 12 years, it was never going to happen. So a massive nod to the boys. Uh, and obviously, guys, we want everybody, every single man, woman, and child that loves baseball to come in every week and listen to the podcast and be a part of the show, just as, as you were in the days of Channel 5. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you about the social 
social handles. Now, there's something I never thought I'd hear myself say. Uh, on Instagram and Twitter, it's at Johnny and Josh. Nice and easy. Johnny without an H. Don't put the H in. At Johnny and Josh. On Facebook, all you've got to do is search The Johnny and Josh Show. And guys, do subscribe. Please join. Please be a part of the family. Get involved. We're going to do a mailbag every week. Uh, and we want your questions. We've got a few this week. And we've heard from many people telling us uh, why and how they got into baseball. We'll try and get a few mentions as well. So just like the glory days of Channel 5, that's one of the few things we definitely will be looking back with a great nostalgic touch is getting you involved as much as possible. So to kick things off in true style, uh, welcome to the swinging 60s. And I'm not talking about the decade I was born in. I am, of course, talking about this ludicrous season, JC, uh, that's gone from 162 regular season games to 60 regular season games. What the hell's going to happen, big guy, between now and September the 27th? All right, Goldie. So there is precedence for this, but you got to go back to 1868. That was the last time there were 60 games in a big league season. And here are the three things you need to know, JG. You got to know that if you have a bad start in a 60 game season, you are completely out of it. And I think back to last year when the Washington Nationals went 19 and 31 to start the season. And then because it was 162 game season, they were able to go on to win the World Series. In this year, even if they won their next 10 and went 29 and 31, they probably wouldn't make the playoffs because we're looking at about 31 games to make it. It's going to be really hard to separate when we get down to the wild cards. The playoffs are going to be the same, even though the season is only about 37% of a regular major league season. USA Today did an analysis before the year, and even with the 162 games, they thought that four teams in the National League, the Mets, Phillies, Reds, and Diamondbacks, would finish tied for the second wild card spot. Now, with the truncated season, we're looking at not only those four teams, but possibly two or three other teams tying at that number. So we are going to have a real log jam near the end of the season. The margin of error is going to be really low. And the last thing you need to understand about the 60-game season is that the schedules are not really going to be balanced. The way it's set up is that teams are going to play within their division and then play a certain number of games against regional rivals from the other league. So it's going to try and keep the games very closely compacted in terms of travel. What that means is that some teams are going to get a huge advantage. So if you're looking at last year's opponents winning percentages, the Twins, Indians, Cardinals, Chicago White Sox, and Dodgers – all have really easy schedules. The hardest schedules, Marlins, Angels, Orioles, Mariners, and Rockies. JC, can I just pick up on that point? Because that's really interesting. You're looking at uh, the records from last season in terms of determining what's going to be an easy schedule. I read another article which was talking about the comparison between a 162 regular game season schedule compared to what we now have. And very interestingly, again, you, they confirm what you were saying. The central divisions are the ones that are definitely going to benefit. But they have the ones that are going to have the biggest change from relatively hard to relatively easy is the Reds. The Reds that a lot of people are tipping as a potential outsider in this crazy season. The Twins, the Cards, Cleveland, in that order are going to have the easiest schedule by comparison to what they would have had had it been 162 games. Now this surprises me, by the way, and I'm interested in your point of view on this one, Eric, because you look at the fact that they've brought the divisions together, the American League and National League together, and I'm hating that. As a Braves fan, I'm hating the reality that we're now only going to be playing Eastern Division sides, which means we've got to play the Yankees, we've got to play Boston, we've got to play Tampa Bay. These are good sides. That is a tough schedule. And yet, according to these stats, it's the central that's the, that's the real benefactor. Whereas I think certainly in terms of the hardest job, I hate the fact that the Braves are now in a combined Eastern Division. Well, everyone who knows me knows my stance on how much I loathe interleague I always, say, I always said that uh, the National League and the American League should always remain separate. I know, controversial, but I, I always say they should never meet until they get, get to the World Series. Sure, have the odd exhibition game, pregame, all that stuff, but yes. Now we're going to have interleague galore with this 60-game schedule. It's not really, you know, we got DH in, in both leagues. It's not really going to have a separation of oh, who's going to, you know, who's going to be better, NL or, or AL. You say you galore, know, but JC, it's actually what? It's a third. So you're still going to play two thirds of their games against their own division. 
here's what you got to keep in mind, Goldie. When you're looking at 60 games, anything is possible. If we talk about a 162-game schedule, you could lose 100 games. You still win 62 games. That's the worst team in baseball. So when you have such a small sample size, you're going to have tremendous variation. Sure, there are going to be some of the teams we expect making it to the postseason, but I promise you there's going to be one or two teams right at the end of those 60 games who you had no idea who you thought was going to be at the bottom of the basement who are in the race because they just happened to pull together a pretty good run. And another thing, uh, Johnny, one thing to, to, to bear in mind, there'll be a lot of asterisks in uh, the record book uh, this season because, let's face it, we're not going to get a 20-game winner this year. We're not going to get somebody who hits 100 RBI, maybe. Uh, or in, 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 there won't be 50, game, uh, 50 homers that won't be uh, – think of all the, schedule, the records that will not be you – know, or the standard, you know, target that a pitcher or a batter would go for as a successful season. But should there be an asterisk, JC, in terms of, say, the World Series winner of 2021, should there be an asterisk that it's not a real win? I mean, at the end of the day, the playing field is level for everybody. It's, it's, you still yeah. got to win it. Oh, I agree, JG. I sort of think the season is the season. And even if the rules change, you play it, and whoever is the best deserves to carry the trophy at the end. And I, I think really what we're looking at is just so much uncertainty. You have uncertainty with rosters. You have uncertainty with different rules. It's all different. So it's going to be exciting, but it's going to be unlike anything we've seen before, and it's going to be a season unto itself. And just to pick up on the last point, I love what you were telling us about the travel and the differences that, 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 that that's going to make. Um, uh, very interesting, of course, again, that the, the, the benefactors um, seem, to be, uh, seem to be the likes of the Brewers, uh, the Cubs, and they were talking about the mileage that they're going to be doing. It's sort of around the sort of three, four, 4,000 um, mileage. Right? When you compare that to the, the Rangers, they're apparently going to be doing 14,706 uh, miles by comparison. Is there a danger that some of the central teams may even end up going on buses rather than taking planes? I mean, I wouldn't think it would be the worst idea. And, you know, we talk about exposure to COVID-19. The more you travel, the more you're exposed to it. So it puts those teams at a little bit more risk. Teams like the Rangers, you mentioned the Astros, who are going to go nearly 14,000 miles, Seattle Mariners, almost 12,000 A's and Rockies. That's a lot of travel for those teams. So you're going to have to watch closely that they are able to stay fit. And how big an impact is that going to have on performance, given that they're, they're used to travel? I mean, that's what they do every season. I, I think it's less about how difficult it's going to be for the teams to take tremendous travel, but the advantage for teams like the Brewers that you mentioned, the Cubs, the Tigers, Cardinals, and Reds in the Central, who are all traveling less than 5,000 miles. Having less travel is going to be an advantage. Certainly come the playoffs. Okay. Now, it's one a, more thing. Hang on. This is, this is where I, I come in as my producer myself. Okay. End of that segment. <laughs> yes, that, that, that bell is going to get is. very annoying towards the end of this. I agree. That's my job. Uh, one thing, one more final thing to add, which I will uh, as wait, well. Wait, no, 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 no. You hit, you hit the bell. No, 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 no. Because no, no, what we have to do is this little segue here. The All-Star game is not going to be played this year, of course. It would have been last week in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium. Yeah. But there will be no All-Star game. So they so the MLB have decided that they will award the all, the 2022 All-Star game to Dodger Stadium. Which brings us to a trivia question, which we should have done off the top, but I'm going to do it right now. A in-game trivia. Anybody who remembers the show, there's always in-game trivia every game. Is this for both Where, of us? Or just for yes, both? yes. I will stu try to stump, uh, I will try well, to stump Goldie, both of you. Goldie, you've you've had you. 12 years to get better at your baseball knowledge. If was, you haven't done anything else, you've played so much fantasy baseball, you should actually know something okay. about the game. Next. Now you see, okay. we do this for the whole season. I'm going to be 0-34. <laughs> see what that is? What's that, Johnny? What's that? Waffle. Yeah, that's what you're doing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Less waffling, please. You've got um, a bell. You've got a waffle. Have you got like a props box? Don't, exactly. don't, don't make me use this. <laughs> where, where, where's the wig? Okay, now here, now here's a, today's in-game trivia. Okay, yeah. uh, this is by Daniel Salmon, who supplied this, by the way, a uh, local local boy who lives near me who uh, likes to stump me with baseball trivia. Okay. And here is it is for you guys. There have only been two players who have represented five different clubs at the All-Star game. So which player, which two players have represented five different baseball teams at the All-Star game? 
Well, let that cogitate in your mind. We'll do. We'll give the answer at the end of today's show. I know, so, this, is, I, I know this is audio, but I'm putting my hand up because I want to ask a question. Can I, can I ask for a clue? Are these two players from my era? As in, okay, and right these two players the would have been from the era, well, actually, conveniently enough, from the era that we were on air between 1997 and 2008. Uh, okay, okay. So, and, and one of them, here's another added clue just for everyone out there and, and you guys, because I know that you get, you'll start crying if you don't get it right. Yeah. Uh, one of them actually played for my beloved Montreal Expos. Okay. And the other one actually played uh, with your Atlanta Braves at one point in his career, Johnny. Okay. So there's, there's, there's your two okay. clues out there in the ethos. You yeah. have until the end of the show to let it cogitate. And so we'll be I don't want to get everybody too excited, but I had a name and your second Let's clue. Wait, sit on it and we'll, we'll, we'll reveal the answers after say, it. Josh, sit it. on it. Let it cogitate in your mind. Now. Okay. Next topic. Let us move on because I'm going to throw out our second question, our second burning question of the podcast. All right, Gouldy, I know on a personal level, sometimes rules do not apply to you. Anyone who has seen you speeding late at night on the M4 Boy, will attest to this. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. You can either confirm nor deny. So even though the rules don't apply to you, you are a stickler for doing things by the book for others. So Gouldy, how are the rules going to change into the 2020 season? How that's how is that going to affect? Well, I'm, I'm going to take issue with you. First of all, the rules do apply to me as they should. And the fact that I've lost my license three times proves it. So moving on swiftly. Um, yeah, there are a number of changes, as you know, boys. Uh, the big three, obviously, the uh, the designated hitter is now not just uh, going to be in the American League. It's in the National League. It's universal. We've got the three batter minimum uh, or end an inning uh, rule for the pitching change. And of course, we've got the runner on second base to start extra innings. There are some other little ones we'll talk about those later but let's focus on the big three let's first of all start with the dh uh, obviously now universal i'll be really interested to hear what you boys have got to say uh, about this it does beg the question will this breed new life into certain players uh, matt kemp springs to mind uh, you've got bad defensive players who can now be hidden on the dh in the national league that otherwise wouldn't have happened carl schwarber of course for the cubs you've got injured players who can now be rested in a dh position which would only happen when it was interleague from the national league the one that springs to mind for me, Ryan Braun, had him in my fancy team last year. You've got Hunter Pence in the Giants uh, lineup, of course. They've just lost Buster Posey. He's opted out. Uh, so that could be key for them. Uh, Cespedes at the Mets. Does that give J.D. Davis more opportunity and more at-bats because they could stick him at DH? Hopefully it will because I think he's a fantasy lock. He's one of my sleeper tips. Thought I'd smash that one in. Um, so I don't know. What, let's focus on that one first of all, JC. What's your thoughts? Are you, are you a fan of this decision? No. Uh, you know, I think I'm not old school, but there's certain rules that I don't like when they change because they affect the strategy of the game. And I've always liked the pitcher hitting because I feel like that is an enhanced element to strategy. You yeah. got to determine when you're going to do double switches, when you're going to take a player, move them in the lineup and do things in order to maximize your opportunity. That's strategy. The DH pulls that out. The DH ends pinch hitters to a certain extent. So I I've never been a fan of that rule. I know it's inevitable. I know that Major League Baseball has been talking about this move, and I know this is going to probably speed it up moving forward. And great for expanding the careers of people like Matt Kemp. But uh, as, as a fan of baseball, I'm not a purist, but I do like the fact that no DH means more strategy. Let me, let me just pick up on that, JC. And by the way, for the record, I 100% agree with you. Do you think that this is a rule that they will continue with beyond the COVID season, as we're calling it? Yeah. So Major League Baseball and the Players Union are going to have to engage in collective bargaining after the season. There's going to be a lot of tension as people who have followed along before this season know to get to even 60 games was very difficult between Rob Manfred and Tony Clark as the head of the union. So it's already going to be tense, but one expectation has been that the DH will go league wide. And the reason for that is it expands careers. And so the union really likes it because you're going to get guys like Matt Camp getting a longer career. Eric, I've read somewhere that they, the, the supposedly justification for introducing this was because it, it would allow them to rest the pitchers uh, who could then just focus on pitching rather than hitting. Uh, Seems like a load of old toss, to be honest. Their at-bats don't long enough to make a difference. What do you think? What do you think? With, with such a short schedule, I, it, it, that does make sense. You know, you want to protect your, your star players, your star pitchers. However, another thing that, that would have happened, that is happening this, this season, regardless of COVID, was the, and Josh can back me up here, the 
a pitcher must uh, must face minimum of three batters or the end of an inning, which also changes and alters strategy for a manager. Yeah, I'm, I am heartbroken about this rule on a personal level because I one of my favorite niche positions in baseball was the loogie. For those who don't know what that is, that's the left-handed one-out guy. And these were pitchers who would be in the bullpen and come in to face one left. As a left-handed pitcher, you have an advantage against the left-handed hitter. We come in, face the one batter, either get them out or not get them out. And that would be the end of it for them. Yeah. And I love this niche so much that I actually wrote a whole article, a absurdly long article, and created my own stat. I read the it. Lump. Yeah, it's I called read the it. lump. I, I, Did you read about the lump, Gouldy? I, I, I read. Well, I. I you, you read like two sentences. No, the lump you, is the. You said it yourself, but it was an extremely long article. I think I got about halfway through it. But so, I loved so, it. So, for the, so the, the, the lump is the lamentably unproductive mound performance, and that's when you get called into the game to face the one batter. You don't get them out and get pulled. So you literally do nothing positive. You yeah. come in, don't get the batter out, you get pulled out of the game. We're not going to see that anymore out of relievers. Now it's possible that a starter could face three batters and then get pulled if they are doing poorly. But uh, I'm a little heartbroken about that rule. But that rule, as Eric mentioned, was going to come either way. And, it, and that's the thing. If I was a GM or a manager of, or, 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 the, or the head scout of whatever major league team, you're now going to start thinking of like, okay, do I go for middle relievers who have more longevity? Do I go for you know, with Joel Zamaya, for example? Uh, would he have, well, yes, he would have lasted as a closer, of course, but it would alter the way you think of middle relievers now and how you structure your bullpen. But, you know, excuse me, Eric, you know, either way, the, you're going to be managing pitching rotations in a different way this season. You're going to have starters who aren't ready to go six, seven innings, maybe five innings at the most for certain teams, or they're going to piggyback pitchers. So we were already going to see sort of a strange situation. This rule has a longer impact. I think the rule to me that is most interesting that's going to be applied this year is the extra inning rule that you alluded to, Goldie. That's the rule that if – the teams are tied and we go into extra innings that each team will start with a runner on second base. Now this rule has been popular in international baseball for quite a long time. And they've played it in the minors for each of the last two years. And I think for fans who only watch major league games, this will be the most jarring change. And I want to pick up on that. Um, just rewinding to the three batter minimum rule, um, like the runner on e for extra innings being starting on second base. It's all about saving time. Um, that they've been saying for a while for the younger audience games were going on too long and and the minor league experience with regards to when they weren't playing this uh, uh, player on, uh, on on second base in extra innings and now they are it has made a huge difference that is fair to say isn't it uh, absolutely so in 2016 and 2017 there was an analysis done by baseball america and those were the last two years without the runner on second base to start extra innings and and in those games, 45% of them ended after one inning. You now fast forward to the last two years, 2018, 2019, 73% of the games ended after one inning. So that really cuts down. To give you a sense, 13 innings or longer, there were 133 games in the minor leagues in 2016 or 2017 that went 13 or longer. There were just five in 2018 and 2019 once we had this new rule. That, that is a massive, massive change. Now, one thing I do have to ask, the rule change with regard to the three banner minimum, uh, that was proposed in the off season. That was not a reaction to COVID. That's is right. That it's, right? It's, so that's correct. It's, 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 it would happen regardless. Right. But, we are, but they're going to flip back with the runner on, or are they? Are they going to keep that beyond COVID season? I suspect they're going to consider it. One of the arguments that Major League Baseball made is that a lot of minor leaguers have now experienced this. I think what's most interesting about this rule is whether there's going to be sort of a pat strategy, a sort of regular strategy that teams are going to take because you have a runner on second and often teams will bunt the runner over to third. So you have one out runner on third. It makes it relatively easy to uh, get that one run in, right? You get two bites at the apple before the inning ends and major league baseball, uh, MLB.com's Tom Tango, who's just a great analysis, looked at this and basically he came to the conclusion that the bunt is a good idea if you're the home team and you really only need to score one run. If you're the visiting team, you're probably going to want to swing away because one run's probably not going to win the game for you. And that is interesting. So the odds drop slightly for the away team with this change of rule, but only slightly. So in the end, it's actually not going to make that much difference. 
Yeah, exactly. And there are other ways to move over runner. I mean, if I'm the batter coming up with the runner on second and no outs, rather than bunting, try and hit behind the runner, try and hit to the right side. So you stay inside the ball, hit to the right side. You're going to get the same effect and maybe you're going to punch one through, score that run and be on first base. Okay, just need to give a quick reference to some of the other sort of small tweaks that have been introduced specifically for this season. Uh, there will be no restrictions on positions players pitching in 2020. I know there was a, a rule change discussed and installed in the past off-season that would require teams to designate every player on the active row that roster as either a pitcher or a position player. They've, they've thrown that one out. Uh, suspended games... If weather forces are going to be cut short before it's official, it will be continued at a later date, uh, but it won't start from scratch. They will continue from where they were before. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, oh, this one makes me laugh. Unsportsmanlike behavior, guys. Uh, they're, of course, looking to maintain physical distance because of COVID. Therefore, they don't want players getting in the face of an umpire, which is a shame, in fairness. That's the sort of part of the color. I imagine, Eric, that's one aspect that it is inevitable and it's obviously the right decision. Everyone's health is, is the most important factor here. But that will take a little edge off the joy of the game. Bench clear outs, etc. I was going to say, there are no bench clearing brawls, right? No one's going to want to kite. You dose a player, you hit a, a player because they've done something funny, you're probably going to get away with it this year. Another thing that's, that's being altered, of course, because of COVID and social distancing and I guess being sanitary is no more spitting tobacco, no more chewing on, um, no more spitting, basically. So that another part of baseball is going to be gone. Not that it's, you know, essential to the actual playing of the game, but you have a lot of players who have superstitions that they have, they chew like 36 sticks of gum in one game and uh, they're spitting constantly. They need those sunflower seeds, uh, pips that they spit out in the dugout. That's all gone this season. Hey, you, you talk about the sunflower seeds. Do you remember, JC, when we went on the, uh, the road trip uh, and we were down at the uh, Round Rock Ballpark, the, the minor league ballpark, one of the greatest days of my life? I spent about an hour being taught how to do it. Now, I've never spat in my life. I think it's a disgusting habit. And there I was trying to gob a corn seed at the third baseman. I absolutely loved it. And, of course, you're absolutely right. That's not going to happen. One quick last reference before I hear the bell. Wet rag pitchers will be committed to carry a small wet rag in their back pocket to be used for moisture in lieu of licking their fingers. Again, obviously, from a COVID perspective, that's a great decision. Um, they will not be able to access the rag while on the rubber. They must clearly wipe the fingers of their pitching hand dry before touching the ball. Uh, water is the only substance that will be allowed on the rag. Is okay, that, a bell? Just, that, that bell sounded weak <laughs> sauce right there. <laughs> the bell's broken. It's hit, the hit it with authority or don't hit it at all. <laughs> all right, here we go. M moving on, Johnny. No, okay. Josh. No, it's, no, it's me. Johnny. <laughs> no, it's Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> just live broadcast. Who's got the bell? Come on. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the obvious factors. Uh, if a player bump, bunts, bunts uh, in an empty ball cart, does it still make a sound? Ambience or the lack of? JC, we've been watching football, Premier League football on the TV. You've got the option of having fake sound or not. If you don't, it's bizarre. Is it the same problem? How's it going to be for baseball without the crowd, without the noise, without the atmosphere? So, Goldie, I can tell you as a former player that players feed off of the atmosphere, and there is an advantage in home parks. This is true in every sport, right? If your fans are behind you, it pumps you up. And this is an issue that I think each team is going to handle on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the Philadelphia Phillies, for all you video game fans, if you hear something familiar, they're planning on taking Sony's popular video game, MLB The Show, and using audio tracks from that in order to pump in. My favorite story was actually just recently Christian Yelich in summer camp, which is sort of this second uh, spring training. When he was coming up to bat, they started at Miller Park, the, the team started pumping in booze to give him the feeling of a boo. And he said, I'm not at Wrigley Field. I'm at home. What's going on here? So they will notice it. There will definitely be ambiance. The other element that teams are trying to integrate are having cardboard cutouts in the stands. So it looks like people are there and uh, teams in the greatest capitalistic sense, although a lot of these teams are giving the money away to charity are actually charging for people to take a picture of themselves and then put these cardboard cutouts into various seats. And my favorite of all these are the Oakland A's who have different prices for these cardboard cutouts. One price is if you just want to have the cardboard cutout out there, that's $89. But if you want to have a special quote unquote foul zone 
cardboard cutout. That's $149. And what that means is that if a foul ball hits your cardboard cutout, they will send you that ball. Love it. Love it. What a great idea. And another great idea for raising some, some funds. Um, I, 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 and, and I'm assuming, I, could I, as, a, as an international supporter of the Atlanta Braves, could I send my money and get my cutout? Absolutely. But I think that for most of these teams, they require you not to wear the kit for another team. So if you're going to go to the Oakland A's, you're going to have to put on an A's hat probably. Okay. Okay. No, I'm thinking obviously of doing it with the Braves, but is the Braves, have the Braves announced any intentions? to the I haven't seen the teams that I've seen and that some of these have already actually closed the window are the Dodgers who typical Dodgers, it's $299 to get a prime seat for your cardboard cutout. The Giants are at $99. The Mets, uh, $86. Uh, the Brewers at $50. I love this one. They actually put your cardboard cutout. Bob Euchre, famous uh, player and broadcaster, this is his 50th year uh, as the voice of the Milwaukee Brewers. And uh, they'll put your cardboard cutout in the Euchre seats. There used to be this great commercial where you'd say, I'm in the front row. And uh, they actually move him to the worst seats in the stands. Astros are 100 bucks. Mention the A's. The White Sox, $49 for the first weekend. That's already spent. The Royals, $40. Rangers, $50. They refer to their cardboard cutouts as the Doppel Ranger program. And the Mariners, they get tremendous props, $30. And if a foul ball hits their cardboard cutout, you get to keep it. That's the deal of the century. That is the deal of the century. And what I love about these prices, it's almost representative of, of the sort of affluence of the different states, the different cities of America. The Dodgers, $149 for a field level um, cutout and 299 oh, 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 yeah. for pavilion home run seats. I'm assuming your Detroit Tigers, given the success or not that they've had in recent years, they'll pay you to have your dugout, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to say about the Expos are still around. Then, yeah, you, you probably double the money there. <laughs> it will be interesting to see how teams handle the ambiance of the sound and uh, the Phillies executive VP, David Buck, made this comment to the Philadelphia Inquirer, which I thought was really interesting. He said, quote, it's a competitive <laughs> issue because you don't want it to be so quiet in there. Say a catcher is moving inside or out. You don't want the batter to be able to hear that. You don't want batters to hear the shortstop yell to the second baseman, move over to your left. You do need some ambient noise in there. You don't want to blare it out and be ridiculous, but you do need to be fair. Okay, thanks for that, guys. I'm going to move us on uh, since uh, Eric's bell seems to be broken, or is it? No, no, there we go. There, there we go. go. But wasn't All required, right. was it? Because it no, no, we, we we had a nice. Actually, I, I was going to say, ambiance-wise, no more hot dogs at the moment. You can't can't get ballpark food. Can you get it to Crime go? Shame. I think I think you need to show up and say I'd like an Ichi roll to go. Ichi roll uh, in Seattle was a very fine delicacy in, as far as baseball. Yeah, it was a fine delicacy, away. but if I remember rightly, you went up and interviewed some young lady fans, and none of them were actual fans of the Ichi roll. No, they said uh, they they went they on were saying Mariners fans. They were Mariners fans. That's right. The Ichi roll, the garlic fries in San Francisco. All right, all right, all right. simmer down. You're going to get your chance. I know you're starting uh, to get a little loud. Salivating. Right. Right. I know. Moving on. <laughs> All right, Goldie, my turn to ask a question. This is number four of our burning questions. We're saying baseball's back, but there are a bunch of guys who are choosing not to. Who are going to miss the season this year, Johnny? But also, who's getting a shot because so many big shoes are empty? Well, JC, and these figures were, the, 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 were relevant when I looked at them, so I don't know if there's been any recent announcements, but certainly relevant the last thing I looked at. There are 13 players listed uh, that have opted out because of COVID. There's at least three coaches, and I believe there's 11 to 13 umpires. We obviously don't have the name of the umpires. Uh, the two teams that are suffering the most is my Braves, unfortunately, um, and their fellow NL East uh, partners, the Nationals. Uh, they've lost Joe Ross, Ryan Zimmerman, Wellington Castillo, the, the catcher. Um, the Braves have also lost Felix H uh, Hernandez and Nick Makakis, which is a big loss for us, who's had a fantastic autumn summer um, in recent seasons. Some other big names, David Price, of course, uh, newly at the Dodgers. Uh, he's opted out. Buster Posey, let's, find, let's face it, the Giants lineup is, is relatively anemic as it is. To lose one of your absolute hitting superstars, uh, that is a big, big loss. The Rockies have lost Ian Desmond. Um, uh, I think uh, Tyson Ross is still a free agent. He's out. White Sox have lost Michael Kopech, the right-hander. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some big names in there. 
um, and some opportunities. And we, we, we talked about the opportunity that the, the DH is going to offer. Uh, J.D. Davis being an obvious example down the Mets, will he get you know, consistent game time as a result? Uh, who, who do you think is going to benefit from this? Because at the end of the day, I can't imagine that list is going to remain at 13. I think there are going to be more people opting out in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, and Gordy, I'll take a sort of unpopular position on this, which is I think these guys are heroes in a certain way. Baseball, like any other sport, is all about the team concept and the group thing. And there must have been tremendous pressure on each of these players not to opt out. But yeah. for various different reasons, they understood that this was the best decision for them and their family. And at a time where health has to be paramount, if anyone has a concern about the possibility of impacting themselves, their children, their family, they need to step out. So credit to all of them. And it will have a tremendous impact. And you look at your Braves, uh, Nick Marcakis being gone was really directly led to the Braves recently signing Yasiel Puig. You also have Freddie Freeman who had COVID-19. He's expected to come back, but he got hit really hard with it. He hit so hard that Nick Marcakis actually said that the reason he was opting out was that he talked to Freeman and Freeman sounded so bad that it really opened his eyes to things. The Nationals, another team you mentioned that has three players who have chosen to opt out, that's also impacted them a trem tremendous amount with Ryan Zimmerman being out. Carter Kaboom, who is sort of one of their uber prospects, is going to get a reasonable chance to play third base this year. When we were talking about spring training earlier on, he was going to be sent down to the minors for more seasoning. It's really interesting with the 60-game schedule that a lot of teams – in their 60 player pool. So each team starts with 30 players at the start of the season. After two weeks, it will drop down to 28 and then another two weeks, it'll drop down to 26. So rosters are expanded, which means more players are gonna get a chance to be at the big league level. But in that 60 player taxi squad, the additional 30 players, you're gonna have a lot of teams that have decided to keep some of their Uber, their big prospects, in that pool so that those players can keep on getting seasoning rather than sort of being sidelined. And there's always the possibility that some of those players are going to get to the major leagues vastly earlier than anticipated because of injury, because of COVID, because of opportunities that come up. So lots of opportunities for players who are going to be involved. Eric, when you consider the age issue, um, you only have to look at the stats with the awful, awful news that we've had here in the UK with the people impacted by COVID. Um, and they're always talking about those over 70 being particularly at risk, regardless of whether they have underlying health issues, etc. Um, it is interesting to note that at the moment, only three coaches have opted out. Um, because obviously a lot of the coaches are more elderly. Eric Young at the Braves. And I know the Twins have lost both Bill Evers and Bob McClure. And this is interesting. Um, they were taken out by the Twins after the Twins organization took their age and pre-existing conditions into consideration. They did not opt out themselves. And apparently the Twins will pay both of them their full wage. And I think that's classy. I love what the Twins have done there. That is, that is very classy, exactly. And, and in, in, with, an, with a pandemic like this, you just can't cut corners. I mean, uh, I know it's controversial uh, all around the world at the moment, but, um, you know, health does come first before sport. And speaking of age, you know, you think of, you know, other players that, you know, who are getting on. I mean, obviously, Ryan Zimmerman is uh, – this was supposed to be his – potentially his last season at the Nationals. Uh, he's, he's the longest-serving National with the organization at the moment. So it would have been a shame – if he is opting out, if he doesn't come back next season, apparently he is going to come back next season. So there will be a, a final hurrah for him if he does decide to retire or to go on to another team. But things like that get taken into consideration as well. Is this, you know, it's, it's, it's altering a lot of careers. It's altering a lot of, not just for coaches and managers, but players as well. Well, especially, JC, players that are in pursuit of records, you know, get, reaching the 3,000 hit club, etc. Suddenly you've got a season where you've lost 100 games. That could be the difference maker. Oh, for sure. We've seen this over the long span of baseball, though. We had players like Ted Williams who went away for World War II in Korea. It's not uncommon over the historical expanse to see players lose seasons for reasons uh, out of their control. So... This is no different, and honestly, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively minor consideration when we're talking about factors like health and uh, safety. Imagine if uh, Kyle Ripken Jr. was still doing his streak in the middle of all this. 
well, theoretically, as long as he's healthy, it would be easier because he's got True, but less of a demanding be, season. It's only 102 more games, games to play, and, and that's but, it. But, but keep in mind, guys, if you go on the injured list now, what used to be the DL, it's a 10-day list, but say you're out for two weeks, so say you get COVID, you're looking at missing a quarter of the season right there. It just yeah. takes one time on the disabled list, on the injured list, to basically take away a quarter of your season. So yeah. it's really going to be in flux, assuming the season makes it all the way to the end. Time just, will tell. Can I just pick up? Sorry to hear the bell, Last point. Gonna, Last you, point. You used to do this to me on the show. You can yeah, I'm still doing it now. But now I have a bell. <laughs> okay. A very, a very wimpy bell. You mentioned Cal Ripken Jr. And I want to ask the two of you, what was the length of his streak? The exact number, please. Well, he broke Lou Gehrig's 2,130. It's not what I asked. You're, 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 you're trying to throw trivia number. back. What, wait, what wait, I was tell you is I actually was at the game in which he tied Lou Gehrig. Is that right? Yeah. So, you're so that's the only thing I'm going to offer. And now I'm gonna, we're going to move on. Bell, please. 2,632. It's the one stat I've never forgotten. 2000, <laughs> the waffles being shown. I'm amazed Eric that waffle Jones. hasn't had a bite taken out. Can you right. believe this, JC? Food in the presence of Eric and it hasn't been eaten? Gouldy, I believe Excellent. you have a Moving on. For me. <laughs> Bring <laughs> it. Bring it. Okay. The, the last of our five burning questions. JC, you've already made a small mention to the minor leagues. We know what's happening in the major leagues, but there's no minors. This is devastating news. You played in the minors. What's your, uh, your input on this? I'm deeply heartbroken, and this is a quiet side story that people haven't talked about, but will have such a long-term impact on baseball, the way players develop, and the way we look at the game. This is the first season without a minor league campaign since 1901, but you're going to see that a lot of these teams do not come back. There were 160 teams last year, and most experts are expecting that about half of those teams will either go insolvent or will have to be sold because the teams can't keep on going. Major League Baseball was already planning to contract 42 teams, but I think that this is going to give them the excuse to contract more teams. And anyone who's ever been to a minor league baseball game, that is baseball in one of its purest forms. Now, I think minor leagues will continue to occur, but in a very different manner. I played minor league baseball in an independent minor league, the Frontier League. I'm actually wearing my Zanesville Grays cap from the Frontier League team I played for. And I think that those independent leagues have the opportunity to fill the void. But it's very different seeing a player who is unaffiliated with a major league team compared to watching these guys start in rookie ball and knowing that they're one day going to play for your favorite side at the highest level and watching them develop. It's a huge dynamic for the fan base. And one, I'm afraid that's going to be lost in a tremendous way. Let me ask you this. Do the major leagues take the independent minor league teams as seriously when they are scouting for potential talent as they do their own farm system? No, I wouldn't not. say as, as much because you don't have control over those players. And the assumption is, is that the best players are all playing in affiliated teams right now. But we're already seeing that they are shrinking that level. Well, one thing that Major League Baseball did this year is that their amateur draft uh, the rule four draft was only five rounds this year. It is typically 40 rounds. So already this year, you're looking at 35 rounds of players who would have been in the minor leagues and affiliated minor leagues now moving over to independent ball. So I do think teams are going to take it vastly more seriously when independent baseball comes back. That's been pretty much closed off this year as well, too. So it's really tough if you're a minor leaguer to maintain your baseball. And actually, European players have an advantage here. There are a few affiliated minor leaguers who are European who are actually going to play in Europe because European leagues have started up. Italy's playing, the Czech Republic's playing, the Netherlands are playing. So those players are actually getting to play baseball, and they're going to have an advantage this year compared to minor leaguers who are in the U.S. Eric, there is some merit to shrinking the draft. Um, I know there was a study by Baseball America, three decades of drafts from 81 to 2010. And according to that, fewer than one in five drafted and signed players actually made the majors. One in five, fewer than. And in fact, fewer than one in 10 produced at least 0.1 wins above replacement. Um, so, so it would suggest it is, it's in need of contraction. And uh, I've, luckily for me, I've been fortunate enough to have been involved in the past decade with Major League Baseball's European game development uh, program and in Africa as well, where I've been seeing 
the progress being made by the, the coaching staff and the development staff from Major League Baseball trying to preach the gospel of baseball in Europe and try to nurture the European youth into getting into the farm system in the U.S. or in college and eventually, so, you know, their chances are, you know, not as high as an American would be or North American, but at least there was a chance. Now we're going we're gonna to see whether this European game development, which is now the pause button has been pressed on it because of COVID, of course, uh, will, they, will they benefit from it? I know Josh and I, we were having discussion uh, the other day about whether Europeans can, uh, th this, will this be an opening of a door for them that they could actually maybe have a better chance to get to the majors? Gould, Gould, I want to push back on the study you mentioned because you need to take more of a holistic uh, look at the minor leagues. There's a term that's often used for minor leaguers who don't make it to the major leagues or really don't have much of a shot. They're called organizational players. And they play a vital role in terms of getting the players who do make it to the majors ready and prepared to be big league players. Because unless you get competition against solid, strong players at each of those levels, and you need the bodies, you need that level of talent in order to help those players at those levels, those guys who you're mentioning who actually do make it will never get to where they need to get to. Well, yeah, as far as Europeans go, what do you reckon? Again, I think that in the short term, there's an advantage. In the long term, it hurts everyone. What people forget is that major leaguers don't just sprout up overnight. They need to develop. Baseball is a real skill-specific sport. So if you draft a great athlete, for example, they sometimes need a tremendous amount of time to develop. The story that always comes to mind is Derek Jeter. When he started in the minors, he made dozens of errors. He was really raw. He was an incredible athlete. He needed that time to develop. And unless you have a vibrant minor league system, those players aren't going to be able to get better. And I think that goes for Europeans too. You need to give them that chance and you need that for the knock-on effect of making baseball better in Europe. So I'm heartbroken about this from both the community level where you're looking at, you know, towns like Pensacola, Florida that are getting impacted by this. And I look at it from the development level as a bad choice. This is purely a money play and that's just wrong. JC, you just mentioned Pensacola. Um, they, they've been quite original in how they're looking to um, uh, uh, react to the obvious revenue impact of COVID. I love the story that you mentioned to me. Can you share it? Yeah, it's so the Pensacola Blue Wahoos, which were the double A affiliate for the Minnesota Twins, uh, they have a stadium that's 5,038 people. And they were trying to figure out a way to raise revenue. They put the stadium on Airbnb. I love this. Full month, 30 plus room nights, they sold it out. No vacancy, 1500 bucks a night. You could have up to 10 people and people love that. And I wonder if these cathedrals of baseball will become the next hotels of baseball. Do you, do you know if you're allowed access to the field? Yeah, you have access to everything. You can go out, you can take grounders, you can have a, a game oh, with your mates, oh, some BP. What a, what a great stag, dude. What a can great idea. Get, can one of you get married again? We could all go, it would just be so much fun. As long as you stay in your bubble. <laughs> okay, so I think we're all in agreement. It's a disastrous piece of news and perhaps one that isn't being focused on and needs to be done. Um, would you agree that some contraction was required, but just not to the degree they're now talking? You were saying potentially 50%, JC. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a strong sucker on this one, Gouldy. I really don't think that there should be any contraction. Uh, I, as a person who represented players for a number of years and saw what they went through in the minor leagues and the experience, every level is important. And the way it's set up is that it's a ladder from rookie league, single A, double A, triple A, and you need each of those levels. There are players that need each of these levels. So uh, I, I'm not a fan of even the 42 that they had planned on. Okay. And speaking of contraction, um, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll do that for myself, actually, but uh, I'll wrap this up. Speaking of contraction, this whole uh, pandemic as well has put on the, the back burner or maybe even kiboshed the, uh, the whole notion or, I, or, or idea that perhaps a Tampa, Tampa Bay Rays will relocate to Montreal or will the Montreal Rays uh, share. They'd have the, the, as an idea before this all happened that they'd share half the games in Montreal half the games in Tampa. Uh, the, uh, the idea as well that they called the X-rays, Montreal X-rays. Uh, see what they did there? Clever play on words. I, I got to say, uh, that, Eric, that's gonna, that's gonna, It's not going to happen. I can't see it happening anyways, but I think that COVID has now completely killed that idea. 
I've, I've got to say, Eric, your decision to have the discussion about an Expos team during the minor league session of our discussion. No, 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 it's relevant. <laughs> it's relevant because I think it's more important to take care of the, of the minor leagues than worry about this whole relocation of Montreal, Tampa, bell, and sharing bell, the game. Bell. No, 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 it's my bell. <laughs> no, it, it's relevant. Don't... Um, Talking of relevance, talking of relevance, JC, what round was Albert Pujols drafted? It was late. I know it was. It was very late. I think it was the thirteenth. Was it the thirteenth? Yeah, thirteenth. Unlucky. Well, I mean, the most famous. That says it all, doesn't it? Well, the most famous was Mike Piazza. It was like the sixty-second round. Yeah. Back when they had more than 40 rounds. I right. mean, there are always those stories. Fangraphs, which is a great site, did a, a study of if you had a team made up only of players who were drafted after the 10th round, how good would that team be? And it was actually a competitive team. So the diamonds in the rough exist, and they will all be gone. It's a, a, a tremendous loss for me. Do, do you know what I would love? I would love if somebody would put together the Hall of Famers. Let's face it, Albert is a future Hall of Famer. A Hall of Famers list of the, the, the lowest draft position and put a team out and show you where they were drafted, where they ended up in the Hall of Fame. That what? itself proves your point that the minor leagues are so important to the lifeblood of this sport. Goldie will put on social media that fan graph story, which will give some names that can uh, be considered for that type of honor. Okay. Speaking, of Mike P Speaking of Mike Piazza, who was, who I, I hung out with Mike Piazza a lot uh, in Italy doing the game development. And, and then one thing that Mike Piazza said to me was, Eric, never name drop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just picking yeah. that one off the floor, uh, and it's time now to say a massive thank you to all, everyone that's listening in on our first and pilot post, uh, podcast of the Johnny and Josh Show. We really do appreciate it, guys. We want you to get involved. Uh, and don't forget the social handles. Here we go, the social handles. I'm, I'm almost sounding like an old podcast pro. Instagram and Twitter, it's uh, at Johnny and Josh. Uh, for Facebook, just search Johnny and Josh Show, and we do want you to join, subscribe, become part of the family, guys, uh, and uh, we're looking to do this every week, uh, and we'll keep you up to date with all the stories and have a laugh in the process, but we want you to be involved, and we want you to send in your questions as well. Now, we're going to do a little... So Trip down memory quite, lane. Yeah, yeah no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure how we're meant to do this segue into the advert. So I think probably what we're going to have to do, if Harry, if you're there, um, we'll just take a break and.